the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our sermon this morning comes from our gospel lesson, Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 48. I took one verse extra this morning. And he was teaching in the temple, coming from Luke 1947. One of the impressive things about the Christian faith is its resilience. Um, it was not long after Jesus ascended that Christianity came under the persecution of the Romans. Um, and even through that persecution, it wasn't so long later, at least in the overall scheme of things, that the Roman Empire eventually became Christianized. We look at, again, in northern Europe that was overtaken by the Vikings many centuries later. Uh, many of the members that they conquered or many of the people that they conquered were, again, Christians. And it wasn't long after that that many of the conquerors became Christianized as well. So in all of this, it shows you, the again, the resilience of our faith. People didn't run away. The church may have gone dim for a little, a little while, but it never ceased to exist, and in fact, it came to flourish. And as we look in Luke today, we see a little bit of that, and as we go through this episode in Jesus' last days before uh, he goes to the cross, uh, we'll notice what this resilience looks like. So as we go in, we see this is right after he um, in Luke comes in from his triumphal entry what we know as Palm Sunday and the first thing we notice in verse 41 it says Jesus wept over the city and we find this same uh, posture in various other places in Scripture one place is in Matthew 23 uh, where we have Jesus saying "O Jerusalem O Jerusalem I had wanted I have wanted to gather you under your uh, gather you under my arms as a chick, her, uh, as a hen, her chicks, but you are unwilling. So we see that Jerusalem has this spot in Jesus' heart, in God's heart, actually, because this was the city of God. It was the city of David. And this is where God decided to plant his temple. But we see, and as you go along, as you, as you noticed in the reading today, that Jesus goes immediately into this uh, prophecy of its eventual destruction and Jesus knows what's going to happen of course him being God and we notice a little bit of the personality of God himself in his reaction he weeps over it he doesn't go out and boldly proclaim its ultimate destruction he doesn't get his jollies out of it he's not happy about it and this is in keeping with God's character. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live, which is found in Ezekiel 33. So in Jesus' reaction to what Jerusalem is going to go through in the years to come, he notices and he weeps over the city. He's sad to see what is going to happen to it. But yet, something is going to happen to it. And... As you go down in verse 42, he says, Would you have even, even you had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. And this is a kind of a strange st statement. Uh, we tend not to th want to think that God would actually cover his message, but we find in other places in Scripture that this is actually the case. In fact, in, act in, act excuse me, in Luke 8, chapter 10, or verse 10, he um, Jesus quotes Isaiah 6, 9, in which he says that uh, to Luke, he actually says, or not to Luke, but to Isaiah, when he's prophesying to the people, God says, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. And make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes. So there comes a time where God's message starts to become clouded when people turn away from it. 
In fact, Jesus himself earlier in his ministry would say that the whole reason that he was proclaiming the various parables that he was and teaching them was is that precisely because he didn't peep, God wanted the, the, the Jews' eyes to close. He wanted them to be mystified by what was going on. But it wasn't simply because of the fact that he got his, again, that he found some particular need to do that, but that they were, rebe were rebellious. They didn't want to listen to Jesus. They didn't want to listen to God's message. So therefore, God turned from them. And this is a lot of times referred to as an oracle of doom. And then what comes later, he talks about the, uh, the town's enemies coming up and setting a barricade around it, surrounding it, hemming it up, and then tearing it to the ground. And not only will it affect the city proper, but it affects the people in the city. Both the children and the parents will be destroyed. And furthermore, he says, it'll be a complete destruction. They will not leave one stone upon another. So here he's prophesying about the eventual destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So even though Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, knows what's going to happen to it, punishment comes. And this, again, shows the character of God. Not only is he not, uh, not pleased with the destruction of the wicked, he also delivers justice. And the reason this justice was coming was because they did not know the time of their visitation. Jesus was about to walk into the midst of Jerusalem and being their king, he did, they didn't recognize it. Now they thought they wanted to make him king, but, most, but for the wrong reasons. They thought that because of his power to heal, his power to perform miracles would be used to overthrow the power of the Romans at the time, and that he would set up a secular government, one that they had hoped would restore the true kingdom of God and the throne of David. But of course, Jesus, as he, we remember from back in Easter, we talk, he talks about his kingdom not being of this world. So they misunderstood his purpose for being here. And because of that, they ignored him. And no sooner does he weep over the city and pronounces his oracle of doom over Jerusalem, he enters into the temple. And he then proceeds to drive out all of these merchants and money changers that are in the temple and saying to them, it is written in my house, shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. He's quoting two different verses here, one from Isaiah 56, 7, and then Jeremiah 7, 11, and where he's basically lamenting what the Jews have made the temple. So in order to put this in perspective, what was going on is, is that a lot of the, the money changers and the merchants that were doing their business at the temple were in what was known as the court of the Gentiles. This was the only place that Gentile believers could come and pray to God. So there is this kind of robbery on a spiritual level where people who wanted to come and worship God were being denied because it was being taken over by businesses. But yet there's also this other aspect where it was a very down to earth and very day to day problem in that the money changers were more than likely scamming people out of their money. So when people came to the temple from out of town, what would normally happen is they didn't have room or they didn't have the ability to bring a sacrifice with them. Now, if you remember, this is the time leading up to the Passover. So what happens is, is that they have to come to Jerusalem. They have to buy a sacrificial lamb in order to present it and have it killed. In order to do that, you had to have the official temple currency of the of the temple in Jerusalem, and that was actually currency from the city of Tyre. That was designated the official currency at the time. And so what would happen is, is these folks would come in, they wouldn't have the proper currency, so they'd have to go to a money changer. And what these people would sometimes do is that they would shortchange their customers. They would require more money for the official currency than what was really required. 
And because of this, they were basically scandalizing a worship service that God commanded his people to do. And this, of course, is what is upsetting Jesus. And, a lot of, and it's verses like this where we see that Jesus actually gets angry. He gets upset, and he gets violently upset. And especially if you go and you look in, in John chapter 2, there's another instance of this. We think this is actually another cleansing that Jesus did earlier on in his ministry. It actually describes Jesus as having, making basically a cat of nine tails. He was making a whip, and he was going to use this, and he used the whip against these people to drive them out of the temple. And it's because of this that, as we look at the end of the story, the leaders of the temple of Israel, or the leaders of the Israel, or Jewish people, were finding a way to destroy him. And it's also when you look at uh, the disciples in John in, in John's gospel, where they actually remember that this was something that was prophesied about the coming king of David. In Psalm 69, 9, it says, zeal for your house will consume me. So we not only see a gentle side of Jesus in this series of, uh, series of stories, but we also see his jealousy for God, his justice coming out, his desire for people to come to be able to worship him in spirit and in truth. And then we get down to the last verses. It says that after doing all of this, he was teaching daily in the temple. And it says that the chief priests, the scribes, and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. But as they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on to his words. So if it's not obvious by this time in the book of Luke or any of the other gospels, the leaders of the nation of Israel did not hold Jesus in high regard. They saw him as a troublemaker. They saw him as somebody who could potentially trip the apple cart up and cause Rome to come in and punish the city. Jesus wasn't a very safe man to be around. But if you look at what he did, it's interesting, and I think it gets overlooked, and it might be an observation that others may not see, but it's interesting that when Jesus, after he gets through lamenting over the city, pronouncing this oracle of doom over it, and then coming in and running out all of these money changers and merchants out of the temple, you would have thought something bigger would have happened. That maybe, for instance, he made a grab for political power, which is what the people wanted him to do all along. They wanted a strong leader to overthrow the Roman, the Roman authority at the time, and he could have done it. In fact, it says in John 19, 38, that the people kind of wanted him to do this. He could have done something else. He could have started a rally. He could have started a popular revolt, maybe not being a king himself, but causing the people to rise up against their leaders. And he didn't do that either. He could have even have started a cult of personality. And we know that wasn't going to happen because of his, who he was. It says simply that he was teaching daily in the temple. And this is what made Jesus dangerous. And it's what makes the church dangerous. A lot of times we think that our power comes from getting the right candidate into office. Or it revolves around political power. And that's not the case. In fact, if that's anything that corrupts the power of the church, because we get enmeshed in things and we compromise our integrity a lot of times. The odd thing, or the, the, the thing that is so clear, but yet so surprising, is, is that Jesus was simply faithful to his task of teaching, both in his role as the Son of God, and his role as a rabbi. 
He remained faithful to the teachings of the scripture. And it was by this means that we, as a church, were able to transform culture, both in the Roman Empire, both in Europe. And one would say that we transform culture for the better because people who were once in darkness had seen a light, as it says in Isaiah, and that they understood, whereas before they were ignorant of the truth of the gospel. And this is the simple teaching day in and day out that actually expanded the church in its early days. They didn't have religious rallies. They didn't have political rallies. It was simply men and women traveling to and fro within an empire and simply teaching people about Christ. And that is what transformed an empire and continues to transform hearts even today. I remember reading a book about a year or two ago. It was a book on uh, the two great awakenings that we had in the United States. Uh, so for those of you who may not know totally what those were, we had uh, a, what was called the first great awakening before we became, actually before we became a country. So people like Jonathan Edwards uh, were prominent in that particular era of church history in this country. And then we had another great awakening sometime later, sometime after the Revolutionary War called the Second Great Awakening. And in the Second Great Awakening, this is where we get a lot of the tactics that we do now in a lot of independent churches on how to present the gospel or how to move people to work the gospel. But the author comes up with an, you know, with an interesting observation. He said, you know, that throughout the First Great Awakening and these men like Edwards and others and the Wesleys, they didn't really do anything special other than just preach scripture. Uh, it was a simple faithfulness of going to church every Sunday and preaching what God had written down in his word. Uh, there was no uh, necess necessity for power. There was no necessity for having to devise means for people to be awakened from their sluggishness, as Charles Finney would say. It was a simple matter of speaking the truth, speaking the truth in love. And what was so astonishing about that is, is that in both of these awakenings, more, more so in the first than in the second, that you had these mass of people converted. Something about the word of God, as Paul says, it came not only in truth, but it came in power and in the spirit. And this is what moved people who, again, were dark in a dark place and broken in sin, came to see the glory of Christ and so be saved. And this should challenge us as individuals that because of the message we have, that is the reason that makes us powerful. Because it's not our power. It's God's power. And as we go out, it's that simple sharing of the gospel, that simple teaching of the Bible is what changes culture. Uh, it's not to say that rallies can't do that. But when you look at over the 2,000 years of the church, it's always been that steady persistence, like a slow drip, that changes cultures, it changed people. And this is what Jesus was so faithful at doing. You notice throughout the Gospels, he wasn't trying to whoop up excitement. He was simply teaching the Word of God. And it was because of this that the people, you know, the rulers and the authorities of the Jewish people got so upset because people were hungry for that. They were hungry for the Word of God. And this is the challenge that we have today. It's not the size of our church. It's not the size of our egos. 
that will change hearts. It is the faithful preaching of the scriptures and the faithful teaching of the scriptures, not only on Sundays, but throughout the week. So take heart, especially in our days when there's such rabid opposition, to continually and to be faithful to what God wants us to do, which is to share his word and tell people about the good news of what Christ has done for a sinful and broken world. Amen.